Case in a small farming town. She's walking through the streets on a quiet Sunday morning. He came upon a large crowd gathered by the side of the road. So going by instinct, you know, some of the attorneys, if there's a crowd gathered there and there's an accident or something, he figured there was some sort of a collision. So he was eager to get to the injured parties, but he couldn't get near the car. So he started shouting loudly, let me through, let me through. I am a son of the victim. So the crowd made way for him, and lying in front of the car was a donkey. <laughs> you liked that one better, didn't you? <laughs> the Mount of Olives is a ridge, if you can picture this. It's a ridge running along the eastern side of Jerusalem. It's separated by the city, by the Kidron Valley, which is just mentioned in the Bible a few times, the Kidron Valley. And this mountain was once covered by olive trees, and that's why it's called the Mount of Olives. David, when he was escaping the Absalom Rebellion, uh, where his son Absalom was trying to take over the kingdom and actually threatened his life, and it said, David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads, too, and were weeping as they went up. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 15. So Jesus made many visits to the Mount of Olives. And in fact, it was usual for him to go there uh, when he was in the neighborhood of Jerusalem. He hung out up there. Um, every time Jesus visited Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, he was on the Mount of Olives because the village of Bethany, where they lived, was on the Mount of Olives. That's where it was situated on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. The road from um, um, Bethany to Jerusalem um, lay over what they call Olivet. And the Bible records Jesus visiting the Mount of Olives three times in the last week of his earthly life. And each time something of significance happened. One of those, the first, what we call the triumphal entry. That's why we celebrate Palm Sunday. And, and the donkey Jesus rode that day was found in the area of Bethany and Beth Page on the east side of the Mount of Olives. Then when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Of course, they were, uh, they were in the neighborhood. That was where he raised Lazarus from the dead. So while still on the Mount of Olives, Jesus looked at the vista in front of him. He wept over the city and pronounced a judgment against it. That would be in verses 41 and 44 of uh, Luke chapter 22. Jesus' second visit to, to the Mount of Olives was to deliver what has become known as the Olivet Discourses recorded in Matthew 24, and parallel passages are found in Mark and also in Luke. The content of the Olivet Discourse is Jesus' response to his disciples' question, when will these things be, and what will be a sign of your coming at the close of the age, Matthew 24 and 3. Jesus' third visit that's recorded was uh, uh, during the week of his passion, that's what we call the week of his passion, it was on the night he was betrayed. He was there in the Mount of Olives. The evening began with the Last Supper down in town, down in the city of Jerusalem, and ended in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. During the last Passover meal, Jesus washed his disciples' feet and then revealed to Judas as the betrayer at the conclusion of the meal, Jesus established the new covenant, which we celebrate as our communion. And um, then he took the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, which
which literally means the Garden of uh, the Olive Press, located on the western slope of the Mount of Olives. Let's picture that. The eastern slope is toward Jerusalem. The western slope is on the opposite side of the mountain. And that's where Gethsemane was. There Jesus prayed in agony as he contemplated the days to come, the day to come. And so overwhelmed that his sweat was like drops of blood. And God sent an angel from heaven to strengthen him. So after the trials, crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus once again stood on the Mount of Olives. During his final post-resurrection appearance, Jesus led his disciples out to the vicinity of Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now, when he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So the vicinity of Bethany was indeed on the Mount of Olives. According to the prophet of, of uh, uh, Zechariah, Jesus will return not only in the same way, but to the same place. In a prophecy related to the end of times, Zechariah declares, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. That's in Zechariah chapter 14, the very location where David wept in defeat, David being a type of Christ. And where Jesus was betrayed and rejected will be the place where Jesus returns in triumph over all of his enemies. So the sermon today is about the triumphal entry. And uh, Mark chapter 11, uh, starting with verse 1, it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, I don't know how you pronounce that, but um, that's a stab at it. Bethphage, Fage, I don't know. And Bethany on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? say, The Lord needs it, and, it, and we'll send it back here shortly. So observe that Jesus sent two disciples to Bethphage to steal someone's coat. To the disciples, this directive must have seemed strange. As a matter of fact, the Eighth Commandment forbids stealing. It was actually borrowing. It wasn't stealing. But this act of taking that coat required special boldness. The coat was tied near the doorway. They would certainly be seen, but they did what Jesus said because he is the boss. Because he said so, they untied the coat. But it's a troublesome thing to go to somebody's house and remove their property. You could get in trouble. You could get arrested. You could get beat up. You can wind up with a fat lip or a black eye. But they did it. Jesus needed the colt. He needed to use it. He always walked everywhere he went before. We don't see any other picture of him riding on anything. We see him walking all over. He needed to ride in order to fulfill the prophecy in Zechariah 9 and 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He told them exactly where to find the colt. Locating the colt wasn't very difficult. It wasn't hard. It would be right where Jesus said they would find it. The hard part of their assignment was to untie the colt and to remove it. You can locate the colt. You can observe the colt. You can go pet the colt. But when you untie the colt, you're invading someone else's territory. 
the coat was tied, like I said, near the doorway. If the owners were inside, the two disciples would be seen making off with the coat. Jesus didn't say knock on the door and ask for the coat. He just said, go untie the coat. So Jesus equipped the two disciples for the possibility of a confrontation by saying, the Lord needs it. If anyone asks, you say, the Lord needs it. So they untied the coat as requested. Now Jesus continue, can continue on to Jerusalem where he would die for our sins. What, what happened? Under his authority, they did what Jesus required them to do. Even though it seemed unusual, seemed odd, seemed strange. But this was on the, on the Mount of Olives. It was between Bethany and, it was either Bethany or Bethphage. He was known up there. And if they said the Lord, those people that had the cult most likely knew. Maybe Jesus had arranged ahead of time to tell, to go, and I'm going to send a couple of guys over here to get the colt, you know. But the thing is, the people who went to get the colt, they didn't know that, and they had to untie it. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied in a doorway. As they untied it, verse 5, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And they answered as Jesus told them to, and the people let them go. The Lord prepared them for what was going to happen. The Lord needs it, they said. He needs it. Untie it because the Lord needs it. This was his triumphal entry into Jerusalem in Mark 11, starting verse 7. They said, when they brought the cult to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve most likely passing the place where the colt was and giving it back to them. It doesn't say that, but most likely he returned it on the way back to Bethany. He said, go, you will find it. When Jesus said, when, when he says go, just do it. When he says to you, go, when he says go, he gives you an impression. You might not hear a word go, but it's an impression in your heart, in your mind, that you're going to do something. Just do it like they did. They just did it. When he says go, we don't need to get a second opinion. We don't need to check it all out. When he says go, we don't need to find out what other people think about it. We don't need to appoint a committee to investigate. We just do it because it's directive of Jesus himself, of God, of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said, go, we don't need to do research. When Jesus says, go, we don't need to weigh the pros and cons when he speaks to us to do something. When he says, go, we don't need to figure it out. They didn't figure it out. They just untied the coat. They just went and did it. If God says that you will find it, trust God that it will be there. He said, you'll find a colt tied there. You trust him that it'll be there when he tells you to do something. He'll provide what he wants you to do. Second thing is to untie it. The colt had to be loosed. It had to be untied before it could be of any service. While bound, while tied, the animal was of no use. You could load it with material, but when it was tied, the material could not be delivered. It could not be moved. You could hook it up to a cart, but if you don't untie it, the cart isn't going anywhere. You can sit on it, but while tied, it will carry you nowhere. The coat has to be untied. It has to be set free. It has to be loosed. And we're like that. We're like that. 
Sometimes we're all wrapped up and all bound up. We have to untie ourselves so we can do what God wants us to do. Amen. Thank you. And I said the Lord needs it. Jesus himself was being delivered. He had to do it according to prophecy. He was, he was always careful to make sure that he did things according to the prophecies. He chose to be delivered into Jerusalem by the simplest conveyance, by this cult. Because it said that's how it would happen. He needed something done. He expected it to be done. He chose certain ones to carry out the task. They were chosen to do this particular thing. And then they went beyond what he asked them to do. They went beyond that. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. They were honoring him. Observe that they had to uncloak themselves and to take off their cloak and put it on the donkey. And some of them put it on the road. To honor him, they had to uncloak themselves. They had to give a part of themselves. They had to give something that was important to them. They gave up some of their own creature comforts to honor God. Fifth, untying your potential. Recognize that God needs or wants you to do something. Recognize that God has something he needs or wants you to do. The prayer of the boy Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You know that story. I'm not going to uh, do the whole story today, but speak to me through your word. Pray for understanding when you read the Bible. Speak to me, Lord, through your word. When you pick the Bible, say, speak to me today through these verses today, Lord. Pray for understanding. Pray for realizing there might be something in that reading that he wants you to do. So then we would have to learn to recognize the still, small voice, that impression that you just get in your spirit of something God wants you to do. And we need to practice obedience. Once hearing, then you need to do. Hear, and then you do. Then the entry Jesus was glorified as he entered the city and carried on an untied colt. In a short time, the Savior that was carried on the untied colt would suffer and die on the cruel cross of Calvary to set you and I free from the law of sin and of death. Jesus has a triumphant entry into the heart and life of every sinner who receives him as Lord and Savior is a triumphal entry into your heart and life when you receive him as Lord and Savior. They thought he was going to kick the Romans out of Judea and establish his kingdom. What he was about to do was far more powerful than that. Instead, he was on his way on an untied colt over the branches that were laying in the, in the cloaks. He was on his way to the most pivotal event in all of human history. Now, we are the colt. You are the colt. I am the colt. Untied, loosed, and made free by Jesus himself. We bring the gospel into a lost and dying world. We bring the triumphant entry of Jesus into anyone's life who will accept him. We bring that message as an untied cult, unbound, untied. So be loosed. Be free. And fear not. Amen? Amen. Don't be afraid. We are, they, didn't, they weren't afraid. They just did what he said. We are the conveyance that brings the triumph of the good news of salvation to those that are perishing 
in their sin. We are the conveyance. We are a colt. The colt wasn't any use to Jesus when it was tied up. It had to be untied. It had to be set free. It had to be loosed. Before it was untied, it was only potential. It could not deliver anything. Jesus, though, had use for it and commanded it to be untied. So what about you today? Do you want Jesus to order you to be untied? His word does that. Do you sometimes want to do something for God, but you just, I don't know, you just hesitate? You're, not, you're tied when you do that. Don't hesitate. Just do it. What if somebody will think I'm weird because I offer to pray for them? Well, if they think you're weird, that's okay. Maybe you are. I would pray for people I never saw in a store or outside. Scotty does that too. Sometimes they appreciate it. Sometimes they say, no, I don't need that. So walk away. But do it. Untie yourself. Do you wish that you had enough boldness to show your faith? You need to be untied. So if Jesus orders you to be loosed, untied, set free from all bonds, from whatever keeps you from reaching your full potential and carrying the gospel and carrying Jesus like the cult did, do you want that? I do. The untied cult carried Jesus physically. We carry him by carrying the gospel. The untied cult. In doing that, we're bringing the light that is Jesus into dark places. So you want to be untied and today? Amen. You want to be untied? Find a place to pray and let's go, let's ask God to set us free from any kind of hesitations that we usually have. If any, if any of you, that, if you want God to just loosen you more than you already are, come and find a place to pray. And we'll just do that. Pastor, God wants to say something. Go ahead. I say unto you this day, you who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And I say to you today, knock and the door will be open. Seek me and you will find me. Ask and it will be given to you. Press down, good measure, overflowing. And I say to my people this morning, I desire to give the good things to my children. I desire to give you the best. But first, you must come unto me. You must seek while you can still find, seek me while you can still find me. You must, you must uh, share my light with the darkened world. And I say to you, many come, but few are chosen. And I say this morning, I have chosen you. I have chosen you to be my light in a darkened world. And I say unto you this day, come unto me, you who are heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you power. I will give you authority. I will give you the answers that you seek for your life. For I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. So come unto me. I say come this morning and I will give you the good things, the desires of your heart. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So.